I'm going to show you the 300,000 XP per minute farm in Starfield. I had the plan for this ready for about two weeks, but I got burnt out on Starfield. I'm finally getting around to it. So I'm finally going to show you guys the absolute best way to get XP in the entire game. Now in this guide, we're going to be doing some seriously cool stuff with outposts. So if you don't know how to use outposts at all and you start to get lost, then you're just going to want to reference my outpost guide 2.0. I'll have that in the description of this video. But we have a lot of outpost stuff to do, so I'm going to try to condense that in a way that makes sense for you guys. We're going to skip over a lot of things, but I'm going to make sure to explain it all as we go in a way that will make sense. This time around, we're going to be using a flow chart, but we're going to have to redo this as we go in order to not only make the background black so it doesn't burn out your retinas, but also to reorganize it in a way that will make more sense for you. This was like my alpha rough draft version from two weeks ago. But the main takeaways are we're going to be using 19 worlds to make two vitinium fuel rod worlds. Now, if you don't have the skills for that and stuff, the levels and stuff don't work, so we're going to get that along the way. So we'll talk about skills at the appropriate time once I get you to the first step of this where you'll get en enough XP to buy any skills you need. Now, unfortunately, since I took two weeks to get this out, I know at least one other person has already posted about this but thankfully his version was not nearly as good as what i'm going to show you in this video in the other version you might have seen you needed 15 worlds in order to only make one vitinium fuel rod world now the main reason that one is so inefficient is because of the lack of math on the shipping because shipping goes off of weight and in that video there was no math done on how the shipping works now, i don't normally call people out like that but that guy was calling everybody out so i just want to make sure if you saw that that you know that there's a better version that's what we're going to be going over today all right it's going to be kind of a longer video i've already wasted enough time so let's go ahead and get right into how to do this if you've got nothing you're starting from scratch you're going to go to jemison mercantile you're going to buy the resources that i have on screen right now you're going to go over to the chairs over there you're going to wait 24 hours at them and then you're going to keep buying these materials until you have a bunch of them some of those materials you may not have we'll craft them in later steps if you run out of materials and you need them just come back and buy more for today's video i highly recommend upgrading to a freighter ship or at least upgrading your storage if you need a guide on how to build a freighter, I have a video for that in the description of this video. The first thing we need is iron, adaptive frames, aluminum, and XP. So to do that, we're going to go to Naren. We're going to build the classic outpost we always make. So it's at Androphon. I'm going to go through this kind of fast. But you're going to go to Androphon. You're going to show the resources. And you're going to try to find a border between the two different biomes. So you can do it by clicking here. See mountains. Click down here. There's craters. And then you get closer and closer and keep looking. You see the right. It says craters and mountains. The reason I'm going over is because people always get lost on this one. So we want to try to get it where it's just right on the edge between the two somewhere like that and then land and see if it's a split biome once you load in you look around to see if there's a split biome and i don't see one here so then i open up the map and i repeat that process until i get one so here's another spot that's right on the edge on the map so we travel there and that'll generate a brand new map and hopefully this one will be the split biome after four tries i finally got this map you can see the split we're going to go over to that split between the biomes once you get there you're going to open up your scanner at the bottom of this outpost is r on keyboard you're going to look around like this at the top left it'll show the available resources and you're gonna follow this split until you get one where it has aluminum and iron in the same outpost. Once you find one, you're gonna place your outpost, you're gonna to toggle view at the bottom with V, and then you're gonna look around to see what you got as far as uh, resources, and if they're good and you like them, you go ahead and go with it. Otherwise, you pick up the outpost and put down a different one, but this is fine for what we need. We just need a little bit here. Now, top right extractors, you're gonna put down extractors as efficiently as you can. Then you're gonna put down solid storage, bottom right tab for modify mode, right click and then E or whatever it is on Xbox, to connect your extractors to this storage box. Then go back to build mode and make a line of storage Storages, something like this and stack them up and make a big area of these then connect that one storage to one of the storages in the giant chain and then connect all those to one another then repeat the same process for the other resource type now you should have something like this so now go back to build mode and go to power and slap down a bunch of solar arrays at the bottom right make sure you have a more total power than needed power then find your outpost marker right next to it, you're going to put down an industrial workbench you're also going to put down a research lab and then you're going to go to furniture you're going to put down a chair or a bench or a sleeping bag which is even better and then you're going to go to the bench or the sleeping bag or whatever and you're gonna wait 24 hours after 24 hours you'll see the green lights on the storages that's how you know all of them are full then you're gonna go over to the industrial workbench and you're gonna use it so here's where you're gonna grind out xp so you can get the skills we need and then we're gonna talk about the skills that we need so you go to adaptive frames you make 99 at a time on mouse and keyboard you can do something like this in order to get 10 to 20 thousand xp per minute and then on Xbox, you can press right on the D-pad, right on the thumbstick, and spam right bumper in order to go fast and get 99 per second or so, which is slower, but still fast. Do that in order to get XP so we can buy skills. Also, after you're done crafting, go to your inventory and drop the adaptive frames on the ground, and then wait 24 hours and repeat the process to get all the XP that you need. Then go to your skills. You're going to want to try to get outpost management. Ideally, get it all the way to level 4. Go and spend some time leveling that because you'll need to do some stuff in order to get it. Then you're going to also want to go to science, and you're going to want to go down here, and you're going to want to get planetary habitation. Ideally, rank 4. You might need rank 4 or at least rank 3, but probably rank 4. 
And then you're also going to want to get special projects level four. Outpost engineering is another good skill to get. We'll need at least botany level one. And ideally, you're going to get scanning level four. Now you're going to grind XP here until you get those skills. You're going to go level up those skills, whatever the challenges are, and come back here to get XP. Repeat the process until you have them all. Then you're going to go to that research lab that we made. And this is where ideally, this is somewhat optional, but you're going to want to get these. You're going to want to get manufacturing at level, I think, at least two. And then you're also going to want to get the resource extraction too. You'll also want to get robots one, which is very easy to get. Ideally, you'll get manufacturing three as well. So you can have large storage modules. And if you need to get these things, you can craft them at the industrial workbench, potentially special special projects, or you buy them at Z Hearts Outfitters on Neon, which is on Voli. So anyway, uh, the other thing that you'll need ideally or want is going to get be horticulture one or horticulture two. It'd be really smart to get these as well. So now you've got to go on a journey and go take care of all of those precursors. And then you're ready to move on. And let's do the rest of this 300,000 XP per minute farm. So let's move on. At Narion, you go there to get iron, aluminum, adaptive frames whenever you need them. And then you're also going to repeat the same exact thing over in Jaffa. There's a star here, a moon here. It's Jaffa 7B. You can go here, you can show resources, and then you can find an area like this where you have the uh, um, titanium, and then you also have tungsten. You're going to make the exact same kind of outpost there. I'm just going to go ahead and skip that. I've already done that, but it's the exact same thing we just did, but with tungsten and with titanium. And the reason we need this one is just so we can make more manufacturing storage, which uses a lot of titanium. Additional outposts that are handy are the one on Andromos. There's a moon over here where you can find one of those split biomes. And on a split biome, you'll be able to make an outpost that gives you uh, beryllium and also gives you copper in the same outpost, which is very, very nice. Additionally, you can go to Razalhog to the right of that. And this one it has a planet here, Razalhog 2, where you can easily find cobalt and nickel together, which are also resources that you'll need. And the main reason you'll need any of those is just for, you know, manufacturing, where it's extractors and stuff like that. You'll run into the problems and you'll know why when you hit the problems. From this point on, I'm going to try to use extractors level 3, everything level 3. If you can't do level 3, you don't have the resources or can't figure it out, you can use level 2, you can use level 1, it's fine. But in my build of this, I'm going to go as hard as I can to try to make everything as high level as possible. Which brings me to another prep step up at the very top right of the solar system or universe, whatever solar system, go to Fermi. And up in Fermi, there's going to be Fermi 7A. And this one has memory substrate. But you'll have to you'll have to transport or import food from Fermi 3 in order to get fiber there, in order to feed the animals, in order to get your memory substrate. If you want, you can do that to get that. Do a bunch of them and then delete the colonies once you have like 500 of it in your cargo or something. It's like the only way to get it in bulk. And why we do that? It's for extractors. You don't have to do it, but it's something that would be smart to do. And that's how you get memory substrate in order to make the substrate molecular sieve. Everything else you need, you should be able to buy at Jemison Mercantile, UC Distributions, or Seagart's Outfitters in Neon Core. And speaking of Zegart's Outfitters, you're going to want to go here often to buy up drilling rigs. And if he has them, buy the Aldemite drilling rigs. And then we can also convert the drilling rigs into Aldemite drilling rigs. And finally, if you need Aldemite to convert drilling rigs into Aldemite drilling rigs, you go to Schrodinger in the middle of the universe. And then you're going to want to find Schrodinger 2. And that's where you find the Aldemite for the Aldemite drilling rigs. Now, if all that went over your head and you have no idea why I was telling you where all those things were, then you're probably just going to want to stick to extractors level 1 and 2 and things that are level 1 and 2. But the main thing is if you have special projects level 4 in your skills, you can go to the industrial workbench and you can make a lot of the materials that you need for level 3 extractors and other level 3 resources. And that's it for the preparation intermission of this video. Let's go ahead and move forward and build the rest of this stuff. So let's start by building the new flow chart with a black background. So first thing we're going to work on is a helium-3 planet in Katydid 1A. This solar system is at the bottom right of the entire map. It's down here. There's Katydid, and then you're going over here. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but then you go to Katydid 1A over here. And when we go here, we're going to show the resources. We're going to go up somewhere. I think the uranium has volcanic. We don't need the uranium. We just want the volcanic because we want to have as little wildlife and brush in the way as possible. You're going to try to find an area like this that's just devoid of all life and put down an outpost. Now, if you aren't familiar with planets like this, the Helium-3 is actually in the air. We extract it with these extractors. We're going to need Indicite wafers. We want level 3 ones, which we'll be able to make during this process. We may just come back to this planet in order to do the Helium-3 on this one. Now, we need to go make a second Helium-3 planet. This is going to be on Ixel-8A. Ixel's up here at the top right of the map. 
You're going to go to there, and there's going to be a planet up here. This is Ixel 8A. So show the resources, and you're just going to go right in the middle of a Helium 3 spot like this. Now, here's where you're going to want to take your time for an outpost and find one that has two good Helium 3 spots, at least like this, or else you may actually not be able to get enough Helium 3 for what we're going to use this for. When the planet's done, it'll look like this. Helium 3 extractor, solar arrays to power them and we'll actually connect everything later. We just want to get it set up right now. So back to the flow chart, we need two antimony worlds, both of which are fed helium three from the Ixel world. So we're going to do this on Ixel 7A. We're already in the Ixel system, so head over to Ixel 7 and find the moon Ixel 7A, scan for its resources, and then find a good antimony spot. And while there is helium three on this planet, I've never been able to find a way to get helium three and antimony in the same area. So just focus on the antimony and make a really good antimony outpost. You'll end up with something like this. There's a bunch of antimony extractors and a bunch of windmills powering them. Then I use the aldemite drilling rig. So these are the best ones, the tier three ones. I haven't put any storages yet. We're not even gonna worry about the yet. We're just gonna get it set up for now. I actually made two of these. So this is one, and then I have another one over here. So we actually have two like this. So heading back to the flow chart, we just made the antimony world. We made the other antimony world. We haven't plugged this part in yet, but we will eventually. We'll send 1X and 1X cargo links to each of them with helium. But now what these are going to go to, they're going to go to Latana 7 world. We're going to make two different Latana 7 worlds, which are going to be have gold, silver, copper, and that's it. And then we're going to send in the antimony to this other world and that's going to make the semi-metal wafer from this point on whenever something's being produced in a outpost i'm going to denotate that with an underlined area so this world produces gold and zero wire on its own and it makes semi-metal wafer with the things that come before it plus whatever's on it so we have semi-metal wafers here semi-metal wafers here and that's what we're going to be working towards so i'm going to go ahead and build two lantana 7 outposts Lantana 7 is to the right of Alpha Centauri. It's right over here. There's a planet here called Lantana 7. This place is going to have everything you need. So this is another split biome case because we need the copper and we need the silver and we need the gold. So you're going to do something like this. The gold and the copper are both in a plateau biome and then the silver is in a rocky desert. So you're just going to find an area like this and then you're going to do the split biome things. So we got rocky desert, plateau, and you're just going to go till you find that seam somewhere in here. Something like that land and try to generate it. just like the first one we did we're going to try to make a split biome if you're lucky you got something like this it's kind of hard to tell in this world but there's some brown area like dark brown and this is light brown and there's the two different biomes so let's go ahead and follow that seam so this one's going to be kind of hard you're going to follow it you're going to look for silver copper and gold now helium 3 is a given because it's in the air so you don't need to worry about that it'll always be there but you're just going to be looking for silver, copper, and gold together. To make it even easier, you may want to find a spot like this near the northern part of this planet where we have plateau and the rocky desert's right on the edge. So the rocky desert biome border will be way closer to the actual gold, which does kind of matter for finding it more often. So this will make it a little bit easier. Eventually, you'll see something like this at the top left. You put down an outpost and then check to see if it actually makes sense or not. I found one like this. It has one copper, it has a gold, and it has a silver, and that's good enough. And this one's ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and build this one up. Once this one's done, it'll look like this with a bunch of windmills over by one of the extractor areas. Here's the gold, here's the copper, and we're good to go. Going back to the flow chart, there was something I made a mistake. I forgot. We need a third one of these worlds. So we actually need three of these. So one antimony world is going to send two cargo links of materials to one of the semi-metal wafer worlds then it'll send one cargo link to another one then we have our other antimony world which will send one cargo link to this other one and it'll also send two cargo links over to this one now each cargo link of antimony sends 375 antimony each which means i gotta run down this biome split even further and look for a third outpost location i found a third one and this one's actually crazy we got a ton of gold we got to cut a ton of silver and a ton of copper so this is just crazy i'm gonna go ahead and build this one up once it's done it will look something like that a bunch of windmills a bunch of extractors this one's so crazy i didn't even need the level three ones i put some level two extractors as well just to save resources now we need the helium three extractor we don't have the indicate wafers and if you're doing it you could just put the level one helium three extractors because you don't need a crazy amount for this one since you're not shipping it to other planets as much uh, but in my case, I have Indikite Wafers, so I'm going to put a few of those, and then I'm going to put in a bunch of level 1 ones as well. I put them down around the edges, and now I need to find a spot for the gas storage. And after that, I just need to connect all the Helium 3 extractors to the storage, and then connect that gas storage to one another like this. And that should be good enough for now for this colony. Now, go do this to the other two colonies on this planet, the exact same colonies. We made three versions of this. Do this to all of them so they have Helium. 
and then we're done with these ones for now and with these out of the way let's look at this graph again so now we have the next step we're going to need these uranium worlds and there's an awesome perfect place for this so on dakaran 7b we can make a world we can outposts that have helium 3 and they have uranium so we're gonna need to make two of those outposts because we're gonna take from one of these colonies one of these outposts we're going to ship two cargo links worth of semi-metal wafers to, to one of these and then we're going to send another two cargo links of the semi-metal wafers over to the other uranium planet and to find that uranium planet go to the right of alpha centauri over here is the star of dakaran and there's a moon over here and it's dakaran 7b now this is also where the vitinium is which we'll be using at the very end of this process and you can also conveniently enough find uranium next to helium so zoom in all the way and then pick an area on the border of the helium 3 and the uranium and generate a map and after some testing what might be even smarter is just go straight into the helium 3 somewhat near the uranium that'll give better luck for finding helium 3 and uranium together once you find a decent area with helium 3 and with uranium then you're good to go but watch out for any marks like this i don't trust any colony anymore that has something like this because it seems to make cargo links less likely to work correctly so i'm gonna go find a better one so ideally you'll find one like this two big helium spots and two big uranium spots so if i make one of these then go make another we need two colonies like this i'm gonna go ahead and flesh this one out though show you what it looked like when it's done and here we are in the finished product it had a ton of helium i put these helium extractors now all these are solar panels this place sucks for power so i needed to make like 350 solar panels to support this so thank god i didn't put tier 3 extractors or it would have been even worse now you can use the fuel generators from these helium extractors but i didn't want to mainly because i like using solar arrays but also because i will use this helium later on i don't know exactly how much we're gonna need so i just decided to keep all of it and just suck it up and just do the solar arrays now save often because if your game crashes thankfully mine didn't but if it crashes while placing 350 solar arrays you're gonna be really unhappy well now i gotta go do this to a second one we have we need to have two of these uranium outposts like this and then we're done here and 15 minutes later here is uranium outpost number two with all of the solar arrays it took 15 minutes just to put the solar arrays down but now we've got the two uranium outposts completed for now so let's head back to the flow chart i updated a little bit i gave a little bit of space here so we could fit in the next thing which is going to be a world called kodos where we get the solvent now i put this right here on the graph or on the flow chart for a reason because that's going to be the best spot to be able to make it not break lines and stuff and fit in nicely. So it's going to ship one cargo link to the uranium world, which brings 600 units of solvent per load. And it's going to do another cargo link of 600 units per load to the other uranium world. For now, it's actually going to lead to, it's going to link to more stuff once we get done with it. So Kodos is in Cheyenne to the top right of Alpha Centauri. There's a moon here that orbits around Aquila. So you'll see it right here. And Kodos has flora on it. So you'll need to scan the flora to 100%. Now, I don't remember exactly what flora it was you need to scan to 100%, but you'll run around the scanner and you will scan the different flora that you see here. So I guess I can actually just tell you what it is. It's the Wanderer's Husk. There's one right here. So scan the Wanderer's Husk to 100%, and then you need to build an outpost like what I have here. So you're going to put down water extractors because there's just water in the ground here. And you're going to put these around as densely as you can in the entire place. You're going to link them to liquid storages, have a bunch of liquid storages. And then you're going to make the structures or the um, builders, builder tab. You're going to go to greenhouses and you're going to make better greenhouses. Now, I need to revamp this place, which I'll do later on in my own free time. But ideally, you'll have the level three ones because they make the most amount of solvent per water and per time and all that but then you'll link all the greenhouses to a bunch of storages which later on will link them to cargo links which will then ship them off to various different worlds so back to the flow chart you may notice a massive change here so that world we just made that solvent world we actually need to make two of those so you're going to want to go ahead and make a second one of what i just showed you and the reason for that is because we can only ship three from each one because they need to receive helium. So we can't do six out. So if we need two, we might as well do three from each one to min-max our resource output. Okay, so a solvent world is going to send one cargo link, which is 600 solvents every load, over to the uranium world. Same thing to the other uranium world. That's two cargo links. Exclude that thing. So that link, that one, that's two cargo links. Then another cargo link is going to go to the Indikite Wafer World, which we haven't talked about yet. So we need to make four Indikite Wafer Worlds on Katadid 3. These worlds literally just mine Indikite, and they just receive a bunch of stuff. And then they're going to take that stuff and convert it into Indikite Wafers. So they're going to take the solvent from Kodos, and then they're also going to take two cargo links from the Semi-Metal Wafer World, 
which is going to be semi-metal wafers for 170 individual units per load, will go to one of the Indikite Wafer Worlds. Then two more cargo links will leave from the semi-metal wafer world and also head to this Indikite Wafer World. Then that other semi-metal wafer world we made, it's going to send two cargo links of semi-metal wafers over to this Indikite Wafer World and do the same thing again over to this Indikite Wafer World. So it's going to use up two cargo links to go into one of these, and then it's going to have four cargo links going out to two of the Indikite Wafer Worlds, which is six of six of its cargo links. Also later on, we'll plug Helium-3 into that, into this world and into this world, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to. We don't need to deal with plugging in the wires just yet. So next up on the to-do list is to make these four Indikite Wafer Worlds on Cadidid-3, which is really not actually going to be all that difficult. It's a pretty easy one to do. So in case you missed it earlier in the video, here's Alpha Centauri. Cadidid is way down here to the bottom of the map. You'll need like 28 grav drive jump range in order to get here. Up here is Cadidid 3. So you want to show the resources and you'll see Indikite at the top of you of scanning level 4. Go ahead and land in an Indikite area to generate a map. Then try to find a decent spot with Indikite like this. And once it's done, it'll look something like this. We have the extractors, we have wind power, and we're good for now. We'll build all the storage and all that stuff later. So just go ahead and do this. Repeat this four times, get four outposts like this on this planet. So back to the flowchart, I've made some more changes. I changed these colors to orange, which is what I meant to do originally. It looks way better now, easier to visualize the solvent. Anyway, we added the cesium world at Dalvik, and we're going to pump cesium into all of the Indikite worlds. So one cargo link goes to every single Indikite world, a total of four cargo links. We'll also have to input helium into this, but that's a step we'll deal with later on. For now, let's go ahead and build the cesium outpost on Dalvik. So Dalvik is a moon in the Narion system. You'll be able to find it to the right over here by the big ringed planet. And there's Dalvik. So you scan it, check, there's cesium everywhere. Just go ahead and build a cesium outpost. Now I already have one built from a previous video, but I actually have to delete this one. And the reason for that is look at these weird lines and different shapes and things. It wasn't like this when I placed it. If you ever end up with an outpost that has these weird things and lines crossing each other and stuff, just delete it and make a new one. It will break the cargo links. I don't know why, but the cargo links never work right on this planet, on this outpost. So I got to delete this one and go make a brand new cesium outpost. Once it's done, you'll have something like this. Pretty standard. Just a bunch of extractors and a bunch of solar arrays to power them. So with the cesium planet partially out of the way, now let's mo move on to the next part of the flowchart, which is the plutonium world. We're going to do this on Ixol 8A. And the reason for that is because we already have a helium-3 world on Ixol 8A. Now it is possible to get a plutonium on a world that has helium-3 and get those both in the same outpost. But I've tested and it's almost impossible if you want a good plutonium one that has helium 3 it may take you literally like an entire day of hunting borders in order to find one if you're lucky so for that reason we're just going to stick to a plutonium only world on the same world that has the helium 3 just to save on helium 3 transport you know without an inner inner system link so to revisit the location alpha centauri is here ixels up here in the top right a level 40 solar system it's going to be up here by this planet it's a moon ixel 8a you can reveal the resources, you can see the plutonium, click it, and go ahead and make a plutonium outpost in one of these locations. Ideally, you'll find the god spot like this one. This one has all the plutonium I could ever need in one single outpost. And again, once you're done, you'll have extractors and solar arrays. We're going to leave it like this for now, just like the other ones, and we'll finish the details with it later on. So let's head back to the flowchart where you will see some serious changes now. So I plugged a bunch more stuff in, but not everything. So now we add on the next worlds we need to do, which will be the last outpost we need to do. Then we just got to connect everything. So we, now we need to do the Vitinium Fuel Rod World. So there's a world which has Vitinium and Helium-3, which is the Karn 7B. It's the only world of Vitinium. We're going to make two of those. Remember at the beginning, when I explained this, we're doing 19 outposts to make two of these insane XP farm plants to double up your gains. Now, in order to do this, if we have some of the stuff we're going to plug in here, we have two cargo links of plutonium from the Ixel 8A plant, uh, outpost. And we're going to do 374 units being shipped to one of these. And we're doing the exact same thing. Two cargo links, 374 units shipped to the other Vitinium world. We also have the nuclear fuel rods. There's two cargo links coming from there, which brings in 120 units per load of the nuclear fuel rods. Then we have all four of the Indikite wafer worlds all being funneled into these worlds, which is the only way I could graph this with the room I had left. Uh, but there's 75 units, which is one cargo link coming from each one of these. So each one of these is sending one, which is 75 Indikite wafers. 
and you get two of them sent over to this Vitinium world, and two of them sent over to this Vitinium world. So each of these is receiving six things. Two from this, two from this, two from that. That's six cargo links for the entire Vitinium world. So now we need to actually make that Vitinium fuel rod planet, or outpost. So in case you forgot, I'll show you again. Alpha Centauri on the left. Over here in the middle is Dakarin. And in Dakarin, you can go over here to this moon. This is Dakarin 7B. If you have scanning four, you can see it. There's Vitinium. Now you're probably going to want to, in order to increase your odds, you're going to want to find a spot like this where the Vitinium is actually right up against the Helium-3. Now before you do this, you're going to want to save your game because you only get one chance to generate a map on a spot like that. So you definitely want to save first. So that way, if it's a bad map that doesn't have anything that you want or doesn't have the uh, double up area with Helium-3 and Vitinium, then you can re-roll it by loading your game and then trying to generate this exact spot again and again and again until you find a really good spot with Helium-3 and Vitinium. Ideally, two of them. Something you need to know about, I did some more experimenting and I think there might be a split biome of craters. I'm not sure. So when I kept landing, it was either Vitinium or it was Helium-3, but not both. And then I, was, I found this one and I looked and you notice those craters over there. They kind of look different than over there. It looks different than this. And somehow one of these is a different biome than the other. So I was able to find the split between the two the crater sub biomes. And there's a Vitinium and there's a Helium-3. So this one's going to be kind of hard. It's going to be one of your most strange and weird things to have to do for this whole thing. But if you can find the split biome of the crater biome, then that's, I think, what you got to do in order to find Vitinium and Helium-3 together. So I was able to find two of them, and I built them up. Once you're done, it's going to look something like this. This is another plant with god-awful solar arrays, but hey. So we got the Vitinium with solar arrays powering it, and the Helium-3 with solar arrays. I tried to put the, the solar arrays in between them, so that way I can save space in case I need it. Back to the flowchart again. It's looking almost done, so we never quite built that one. This is a Helium-3 on Catadid 1A, so I'm going to go build that real fast. And then we got to start plugging everything in and connecting everything. So I went back to that planet and built it up. I made a perfect array of helium-3 extractors. And I made it all centralized here and then fill up these gas storages and go to this one. So I went ahead and already made the cargo links on this one. We don't need inner system cargo links. We just need normal cargo links. And we need four of them, which was actually really hard to jam in here because of the you know elevation of the mountains. But I was able to get them in. So this one's all ready to go. So looking back at the flow chart, I went ahead and plugged this in visually down here. So we need to send one of these to each of the Indikite worlds to supply them with Helium-3. So now I'm going to go to each of the Indikite worlds and I'm going to make cargo links there for the Helium-3. After the first one's done, it may look like this. We have a cargo link here that's not in our system. It's from its output, the green one. It's going to a gas storage and then I'm taking that into a big chain of gas storages and having it end on a small one so I can easily identify where the beginning and end points of the gas storage are. And later on, we'll connect that to more cargo links to inner system cargo links. But for now, this one looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and scale this up and do the same thing on all the other Indikite worlds. I just finished the last of the four Indikite worlds. Now it's time to go to the first of the four control consoles. So we'll see on here, there's Candidid 1A that has four cargo links. Now, it doesn't always update on the right, but it says outgoing resources helium. So we know that's correct. So I'm now going to connect each of these to the different ones. So I got to go from one by one to one to each of these outposts and then connect their cargo links to the Candidid 1A. Heading back to the flowchart, you'll notice that these worlds only have three things going in, two things going out. So they actually have one thing free and they have helium three. So we're gonna take the helium three from one of these and we're going to connect it to the solvent world on Kodos. Additionally, we're gonna take this other world and we're going to link it to the other solvent world on Kodos. Over on the uranium worlds, it'll look something like this. I actually have two sets of storage. I have one that links in here and connects to this and I have one, like some of the helium is linking to this and which then connects to this. And the reason I do this, I have these ones that go to a different box. It goes to this box which is specifically for fueling the inter, the cargo link inner systems on this planet. I want to make sure the cargo link inner systems on the uranium planets, no matter what I fuel. So I have a separate fuel line for them. Then I have everything left over on top of that, or just split basically going into the other one, which is then going to go to this cargo inner link system, which is then going to go to the world on Kodos. I'm going to do this for both of the uranium worlds. So over on the Kodos outpost, once you get it done, it should look something like this. We have a cargo system interlink here that is bringing in Helium-3, which is going to connect to this box. And then that box will connect, connect to a backfill storage, which then that backfill storage is going to connect back into a small box, just so we can see where the hell we're linked to. And then this one's going to link back in to feed it Helium-3. And to feed the other ones Helium-3 once we get to that step. Once all the worlds are set up, you're going to go back to the Uranium worlds in order to start them off because otherwise they won't have any helium-3, which you can correct that 
by simply manually bringing in the first batch of helium three. So you're gonna go in here and you see the outgoing resources as solvent, find the one that doesn't say solvent and that's the one you're gonna connect it to. And now I'm gonna do see the other one and then we're all done for now with these ones. Although I made a mistake on the other Kodos one, which is I put four interlinks on it, but hadn't set up the solvent yet. So I'm gonna have to hash this one out, which you may have to do the same thing if you mess that up, but you'll figure it out one way or another. Back to the flow chart, our next addition is this right here. We also need to deal with these at some point because I marked them here, but we never actually made them. But we're gonna make this we're going to connect the Ixl 8A to the Cesium planet on Dalvik. When you're done on Ixl, it should look something like this. So what I've done is I've separated the helium into four or five different containers. So we have a little bit that goes to one, a little bit that goes to another, like four big ones that goes to each one basically. And what that'll allow, we only need four cargo links from this planet. So we have one cargo link being fed by one group, one by another, one by another, one by another. And then we have this one, which is specifically for powering the cargo link inner systems that we end up putting on this specific planet. And the reason we do it in separate lines like that is to make sure we don't end up in a situation where two or three of the cargo links hog all the helium and then one or two of the worlds don't get any and then they stop working. So we want to make sure that every world attached to this outpost at least gets a little bit of helium no matter what over on dalvik we put a cargo system interlink connected to a gas storage connected to a bunch of gas storages back into a small gas storage and connect that back into the fuel for the interlink and then this one is good to go now it's time to go back to ixel the helium planet and we're going to connect it from the helium planet so it'll bring a shipment of helium over to dalvik so it doesn't get stuck there and now we are already done with this part Meanwhile, on the flow chart, we have another addition. Now we added in this line right here, which goes up here and then over here. We're connecting the plutonium planet to this planet, which doesn't even need a cargo system interlink because they're in the same solar system of Ixel. So now I'm going to do the same thing for these two planets to connect them. Over on the plutonium outpost, we just connected a basic cargo link to a gas storage into a bunch of gas storage into a small gas storage. And over on the Ixel helium outpost, we're going to connect another one of these helium storages over to the outgoing of this cargo link. And then we're going to connect it from the helium outpost over to the plutonium one. And now that one's all set up. Back on the flow chart, now we need to connect this helium planet we're working on to the antimony ones, which I marked, but we didn't actually do yet. So let's do that one. Over on the antimony planet, this is in the same solar system, so we don't even need a cargo system interlink. We just have a basic one. And then we have this one connecting with the incoming into a box. That box is getting stored in storage. And then the second outgoing box here, just for easy access to easily see which one's the final box. Back on the Ixel Helium Outpost, it's pretty simple. We have our uh, helium storage here and we just put on the outgoing of two basic cargo links. Now we go to the control consoles and we connect each of these to the antimony outposts. Back on the flow chart, we need to fix these. I accidentally did something wrong with these. So back on the cadeted helium outpost, I put every single one of the helium extractors into one single chain of helium storages. When what I should have done is split them into four different groups. So one goes to this now, which goes to one cargo link. Another one goes to this and it goes to another cargo link. All four of these chains go to four different cargo links. And there's seven of these helium extractors going to each of those chains. Perfectly distributed. That way it guarantees at least each Indikite outpost gets a bare minimum of helium, even if the supply chain gets weird. With that problem out of the way, it's finally time to start plugging in the non-helium components. So the first thing, let's do this from left to right in order. We have our two antimony outposts, and they're gonna send two cargo links to one semi-metal wafer world, and then one to the shared one in the middle. I'm gonna go ahead and set these up now. When the antimony worlds are done, they should look something like this. I divided into threes again, so we counted all the extractors and divided them into threes. So in my case, I have six extractors going to one box, goes to a bunch of boxes, goes out to this box, which connects to one cargo system interlink. Same thing happens from these boxes to this link and the boxes over here to this link and this outpost is ready to go. And I'm gonna repeat this on the other antimony outpost as well. When your semi-metal wafer outposts are done, they'll look like this, it's insane. So we have silver over here going into boxes. And that box is getting, those boxes are getting fed into this box, which goes into these simple fabricators, which make zero wire. Over here is copper going into these boxes, which goes into this, which then goes into the simple fabricators. So the copper silver goes into the simple fabricator. That goes into warehouse boxes. Then these warehouse boxes go into this one, which feeds into these compound fabricators. Then we have gold over here, which also gets fed in the compound fabricators. These two cargo interlink systems bring in antimony, which goes into these storages, which then goes into these compound fabricators. And the compound fabricators then make semi-metal wafers, which get stored in this big cluster of warehouses, which then I will connect, or already connected, I guess, to the four cargo inner, like cargo link inner systems over here, which will take them to the Indikite wafer worlds or the uranium worlds. 
Also, be sure to keep your storages here to a minimum. Keep a little bit for the backflow in case you need to wait and get some backlogged, but don't make them too big because they are all are technically connected through the fabricators. And if you connect more than like 50 or 100 storage boxes together, then your game will start hanging and freezing. So try to keep storage to a minimum other than the warehouse at the end for the final end product. Once all the semi-metal wafer outposts are done, the antimony is done, it is time to connect them. So each of them is going to receive two of the antimonies so we have the antimonies here's one antimony and then another one for this one then i'll go to the second semi metal wafer world and or outpost and i'll take one from this world and one from this and then the third one will connect to the last two from the second antimony world time to head back to the flow chart so these ones are done entirely they're completely set up so the next thing that we have to do is either do the uraniums or the indicates so next, I'm going to do the uraniums just because there's two of them and feels like I can get it done faster. So for the uraniums, we need to ship out two loads, two cargo links worth of semi-metal wafers from this semi-metal wafer world to one of the uranium worlds and do the same thing from the same semi-metal wafer world to one of the other or to the other uranium world. So when the uranium world is done, it's going to look like this. So we have a ton of helium, ton of solar arrays, so I don't have to, you know, use helium for power. We have six cargo links. We have two that are going to come in with semi-metal wafers, and those are going to go into a storage, um, the warehouses right here. And then we also have solvents that are going to come in from the Do Dalvik place that's going to go into these. And then we have right here the storage from this planet's homemade stuff, which is uranium. And all those get fed into these compound fabricators, which then are making nuclear fuel rods, which then are getting stuffed into these warehouses, which then go into these cargo links inner system. And then these will eventually take it on to the next world. So when you're done with the uranium world, it should look roughly something like this. So now I head over to the control console for the interlink that is supposed to get the semi-metal wafers. And then find the semi-metal wafer worlds. And then connect them to the interlinks there. There should be four at this point if you did it like me. And even though, even if it doesn't say outgoing resources semi-metal wafer, which it does in this case, you can know it's this because that's all we had left in, uh, available at the cargo links on Lantana. So let's head back to the chart for a second. There's the solvent worlds on Kodos. Now I need to go to each of those and I need to flesh them out fully and get them ready for all their shipments. When the solvent worlds are done, they'll look something like this. Now it could be better, I could put more greenhouses, but I'm gonna rely more on the Venus weight trick. So you notice all these storages, you might worry this will freeze your game. Well, what I did here is I made three separate storages so I could have more solvent stored. Each one of these storage chains goes to one of the cargo links. So that way each one can get a giant storage of solvent. That way I can go wait on Venus later on for like 24 hours and fill like three times as much storage without causing game freezes and game, game hangs. So that solves all this, it gets all, it all set up. So now we have three cargo link inner systems on each of the solvent worlds, on both the solvent worlds, ready to access whenever we want. So now we head back to the uranium worlds. We go to one of their free inner links, the one that's connected correctly, hopefully, and then connect it to one of the Kodos solvent interlinks. Do that to both the uranium worlds and the uranium worlds are good to go. So that's completely it for the uranium worlds. They are done, they are ready to go. So now the next steps are the plutonium and the cesium. I'm gonna deal with the cesium real fast and get it set up to supply all the indikite worlds. And welcome to one of the most common cargo link bugs. So right now there's a bug on launch and sometimes cargo links do this. It just disappeared. It never comes here, it never goes there, it doesn't exist. So I'm going to have to remove the link to the cesium world and then wait and give it like a minute or so and then relink it. And that hopefully will resolve the bug, it usually does. So here's the cesium outpost once it's done. I added a second inner link to the helium outpost just because we had a little bit extra. Uh, we had an extra link over there. So this will hopefully alleviate any bugs that we'll have with this one. If you have any bugs, you can try to circumvent it like that somehow. But anyway, I made four different liquid storages and I divided the cesium evenly. And I did this for a few reasons. One is I want to make sure that each of the Indikite wafer planets, no matter what, has some cesium. But also this allows me to stock up more cesium. So what I can do later on is wait on Venus for 24 hours. And then between all these storages, I'll have like, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of cesium without causing game lag. Whereas if I linked all these into a single link, then it would cause game lag. So it's just a win-win. And then we have the different cargo links here. We have four different cargo links that those cesiums are connected to. They're ready to go. They're not hooked in just yet because we need to go to the Indikite world next and get that ready. But the cesium world is done and it is completely ready to go. So back to the graph, we could do the Indikite worlds, but really quick, I want to do that plutonium world since it's a loner world, it's one single world. So let's go sort that one out real fast. 
Once the plutonium outpost is done, it'll look like this. So I made, again, the four different lines of storage, one for each outpost, just to make sure that every single one gets a little bit no matter what. And so we can backlog more plutonium. All the cargo links are ready. There's four cargo links that are shipping plutonium out and they are ready to go. All right, so that was pretty quick and easy for that one. Now for one of the ones I've kind of been dreading a little bit, we got to do the Indikite Wafer Worlds. And the only reason I'm dreading is just because there's four of the things. But I'm going to go ahead and get started on that, and I'll show you what they look like afterwards. So doing four Indikite worlds back to back to back was a little tedious. Also, kind of weird that I did them all in the same map, not even like different landing zones. So it kind of made it really laggy here, so I can't wait to get off this world. So we have one coming in that's bringing us solvent. We have two that are coming in bringing us semi-metal wafers. We have one coming in that's bringing us cesium. And then all those are... And then also we have uh, Indikite being produced in-house here, basically. And then each go into different storages, one for each one, and then coming back to these four boxes, which then feed into multiplex fabricators, which are making indikite wafers. They're going into this box, going into this big thing of storage, and then going into this little connector box, and then over here into this outgoing cargo link for this one, which we'll use in just a little bit in order to send this to the Vitinium fuel rod planet. So now we take another look at the flow chart, and the only things we have left now are these two vitinium worlds so let's head over there and i'm going to get those ones set up and then show you what it looks like and i just finished the second of the vitinium fuel rod world so this is what it looks like we have some mega storages there's one for plutonium with the two cargo links for it there's one for the vitinium which is being mined up which we can you know get whenever we want by just resting and waiting there's one for the nuclear fuel rods coming from these two cargo links and then there's one for the indikite wafers coming from these two cargo links and this i have two of these outposts identical like this and we are ready to farm our xp finally so we just got to give it some time in order to let these things fill up but real fast i need to warn you guys about something that you don't want to do something i did that you do not want to do so i made a terrible mistake that i don't feel like fixing so i mean i might fix it later but it'll take me literally hours um, so I made my two Vitinium outposts in the same landing area, so the same randomly generated map, which that's bad enough. But the other thing I did is the Caddy did outpost, the Indikite ones, I made all four of them in the same landing area. Do not do that. Do not do that because then what it does is it counts as one giant outpost and the problem with having too many storages in one outpost and making your game freeze just is insane so this makes it so even though each of these ones only has like 50 storage boxes maybe 100 storage boxes max on each one it's as if i have one outpost with like three to four hundred storage boxes and so now i'm getting the issues with the game freezing and stuff so before i did the indikite one my game was almost not freezing at all and then after the indikite ones it's like i randomly have the game hang and freeze and stuff all the time and I'm pretty sure it's just because I made these things all in the same land, all in the same area. And it's just like the same generated map. And so it counts as just one enormous outpost. So when you do it, don't do that. When you do it, generate a map for every single outpost or you will probably regret it and be light on the storages. Don't make crazy storages. I'm going to go back and prune some later on. But, you know, it is what it is, you know, proof of concept here. And in my own time, I'll prune all the storage and get the freezing under control. So fast forward a couple hours, I went through, I pruned the storages on all my other outposts and tried to try to reduce the lag. It worked. It lags a little bit, but it fixed it a lot. And I, by the time I was done with that, I also had to put out fires on random outposts. There were random outposts that were just blowing up and, and not working right that I had to fix. Uh, helium's just randomly linked to things they weren't linked to. I mean, it was so bad. A helium was linked to a solid storage, which is physically impossible. I can't do that, but the game can, and it had done things like that. So I had to go through sort it all out, but after putting all the fires, I got it working. The game's still kind of freezing. Not as bad, though. We're good to go. And while I was doing that, all the storages on one of the Vitinium worlds is full on both of them. It should be full, but it's at least full on this one. So it's finally time to get this XP. Now, like I, the way this works is every hour or two of gameplay... I can come here and I can just bang out an absurd amount of XP from these fuel rods. But before you do that, there's two things you'll want to do in order to get bonus XP. So open up the crafting stuff, go over to furniture, put down a sleeping bag or something you can sleep on and sleep for at least one hour. This will give you the well rested buff, which will give you 10% more XP while you do this. Also, there are foods that you can use 
that will give you a little bit more XP as well. If you combo these two things together, then, you know, you can get that extra bit of XP. So you go to aid and you can find things like the Tranquilita drinks that give 2% XP gain for 15 minutes. Be sure to use those every time before you convert this XP in order to get that max amount. Then finally, once you're ready, if you have the XP bus, also, if you slept in the same bed as a spouse, you marry someone, you'll get extra, you'll get 15% more. So if you get all that stuff, you're ready to go. You can get 300,000, but you might need an auto hockey script to do it. So whether you do it or you don't with a script, what you're going to have to do, there's a trick we can use here in order to do this. Even though it's at the bottom, uh, there's something we can do. So we can click on the fuel rod and then go up here. Like we're going to click 99. Now you're going to try to position your mouse to where it's lined up perfectly with that line between the two things, between the tau grade rheostat and the Veril authentic manifold or whatever. And then what happens is after you confirm, if you get it just right here, let me show you if I get this. If you get it right here, it won't select one of the other ones. I can left click right now and nothing will happen. And this will make it possible for you to spam E and left click as fast as you can, even though this one's not at the top, and get something like this. And then be able to burn through all your stuff as fast as you possibly can. Now, if you want to get a consistent 300,000, no matter what, then you're probably going to want to get an auto hot crease script that does this perfectly for you, no matter what, with no user error at all. But even without, you're still gonna get, you know, close to that or even maybe get that actually. And finally, let's talk about keybinds and controllers. So for keybinds and controllers, go to settings, go to bindings. And the main thing is you're gonna wanna go down to the menu navigation. Now on mouse and keyboard, the thing is to change accept over to right click. And then if you can get your mouse off of the keyboard in the right spot, you can do this. But this isn't really important. It isn't really necessary unless you're willing to make an enormous storage on the Vitinium world. Because otherwise, why even change the setting? I mean, you go a little bit slower, but you just process all the materials and you're done, right? If you can only process out like say 500,000 or 300,000 XP in a sitting, 50,000, 100,000, just do it real fast. Don't even worry about the keys. Now, if you are on a controller, instead what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set your right over here. This will be right on the D-pad. You're going to put that to like right trigger temporarily. And then you can hold that, hold right on the thumbstick and then spam your right bumper. And all three of those collectively will help you move over to 99. If you do that, you can do one craft every second, which is about, uh, what was that? 1,000 XP per second, which is 60,000 XP per minute on Xbox. So 60,000 XP per minute on Xbox, you know, 200,000 plus on mouse and keyboard, and then 300,000 uh, roughly is the maximum on uh, mouse and keyboard if you are willing to use like um, a auto hotkey auto script or something like that. And now some other things to keep in mind. This right here is my uh, Vitinium storage. I need to like quadruple this, even though it may cause some game lag. Uh, that's what I'm going to end up doing in my game so that I can process more at once. Right now, I'm capped to like 20,000 per craft, even if these other ones are full, just because this one's not full or this one, you know, is so small relative to whatever. I just need four or five times this much in order to get the most out of this outpost. And then the other thing that I didn't talk about that should get a brief mention here is if you research the robots, then you'll have the robots tab and you should go through to each of your outposts and if they're like this where they produce inorganic resources you're going to want to put six sanitation mini bots and if it's the kodos world that makes solvent then you're going to want six garden mini bots in order to increase your resource production now the reason i brought i saved this for the very end is because i hate placing these until i'm done with everything because they roam around and they get in the way of building things potentially especially when you're trying to put on cargo links so it's just much better to put them down at the very very end of the process and that's it guys if you wanted to beat the game basically that's what it is to me. I never even played the main story, guys. I'm 300 hours deep in this game. I've had more fun than people who've new game plus 50 times, and I've never done the main story. To me, when I played this game, this is beating the game. With this one, I feel a sense of completion. I feel like I beat the game after doing this. I feel completely satisfied. It's like closure. It feels so good. I'm so happy it's done. I'm so happy it works. And I hope that if you follow this guide, that it will feel that way for you too. Now, really fast, I want to have a little end section here to talk about troubleshooting tips and tricks. You're really going to want to like stick around for this part or else you're going to come back later and leave an angry comment not knowing what's going on. So there are some common issues you need to know about and I'll try to help you understand how to fix them if possible. The first one is broken cargo links and the loading spinny when you go to this view. So the cesium outpost for me is completely broken. So you see how I have all this helium storage here? I was able to do it manually, not manually, but this really weird trick. So cesium, the helium does not want to ship here. And the only way I could get it to ship here was to go here 
and then disconnect the links, go to the places that we're shipping the helium in, reconnect the links, and then sit there and stare, or come back here and stare at them for like 10 minutes till the helium's full. And then sometimes it works for a while afterwards, sometimes they just stop working, try disconnecting, reconnecting, staring at them, saving the game, loading the game, all those different things can potentially fix it temporarily or whatever. But ideally when you have one that's this broken, I would have to just rebuild the cesium outpost on a brand new map on this planet. And I didn't really feel like doing that. I'd been doing workarounds instead. But that's like one of the workarounds. That's one of the most common issues you'll run into. Next up, if something's going wrong, you don't see a storage filling, go to the very end product. So for me, it's the Vitinium world, the very end. And then see what's not filling and then backtrack from there. Now you can go to your uh, view mode and go to modify mode and look at the cargo links. It'll tell you what they're connected to. So if I'm having a problem with the plutonium's not coming here, figure out what cargo links are there. And then I'll head over to that control console. I'll take a look. I'll see if it's connected correctly. I'll see if it says outgoing resources. If it doesn't say anything for outgoing resources on the other planet, that means something might be wrong over there in its supply chain. I go investigate that. Also the bottom left, cargo ship 499 of 500. That says 0, 500, or 500, 500, or whatever, and something looks off, then just sit here and stare for like four minutes and see if it ever comes in. If it doesn't, then start troubleshooting, disconnecting, reconnecting, and all that stuff. Cargo links are terrible on launch. Absolutely terrible, so be ready for how terrible they are. Also, keep an eye for ones that say helium incoming, even when they shouldn't, because helium links in particular, and a lot of these links, but helium in particular, if something's not connecting them to the, the fuel supply for the cargo system interlinks, or cargo link intersystems, Sometimes they'll just change and they'll connect to things that they shouldn't connect to so like I'll have it like this I'll come back a day or two later and now it's connected to the outgoing box or something and not connected to the other one They'll just change and things I like I said earlier. I saw one where it was connected to a manufacturing uh, Storage which is physically impossible like I literally can't grab one of these and connect it to manufacturing But somehow it had done that so just keep an eye out for helium It's the biggest culprit for the random like interlink changes But it can happen to almost anything and last but not least if your game starts freezing Uncontrollably like even right now see how it froze a little bit there if it starts doing that out of control it's because you have too many storages linked together, especially ones that are connected to extractors. There's some kind of for each loop problem they have in the code. And so like if you have 10,000 storages connected, it does a for each storage do this costly process and then, you know, adds up to where it just hangs your game for, you know, five seconds, three seconds, 10 seconds, depending on how big your storage connection is. So in my case, I was having it really bad and I had to go to all my worlds and prune all my storages and that freezes a little bit here and there, but it's much more tolerable now. Finally, if you want infinite money from this, what you gotta do is after you craft those and you have thousands of them in your inventory, your weight will be insane. But just because your weight's insane, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're worth over, like they're worth like 100 each basically. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go run to your ship. You could also put down a ship landing pad in the Vitinium Outposts. But get within 250 meters of your ship. You can just run there. Don't worry. You can't die from being overweight. And actually, I mean, not 250 of your ship. You actually got to go inside of your ship. Once you're inside of your ship, just go ahead and get into your inventory resources. Drop it on the ground, and it'll stay here inside your ground, not affect the weight of your ship. Go and fly wherever you want now. Take it to whatever vendor you want, and just unload it for, you know, however much money the vendor has whenever you need money. And you can get infinite money, too, from this. And finally, here is the graph one more time for you to take a look at. Screenshot. Do whatever you want with it. I'll put this in my Discord if you want to go reference it whenever you want. That'll link for the Discord in the description of this video below the first paragraph. But that is the final flow chart of this outpost system. And that's it for the troubleshooting, guys. That's the main culprits you're going to run into. If there's problems, just reconnect cargo links, destroy cargo links, replace them. God forbid, worst case scenario, just place a brand new outpost in a different randomly generated map. And that should cover most of the major issues you'll run into. There's tons of other small issues you could run into. There's lots of bugs on locked with outposts. But that's it, guys. That's the Vitinium Fuel Rod Farm. This is the best version. I know it used a lot of it used a lot of outposts. It used 19 total. It's a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun, honestly. I had a lot of fun researching. I had a lot of fun planning it. This is the best version. I don't think there's any other version. There might be a few little tweaks here and there, but this is the best version. We get two full Vitinium Fuel Rod worlds at the end so that we can maximize our XP output with only adding a few more worlds than we would need to have one of these. So we're maximizing our, you know, min-maxing the amount of outposts versus the amount of XP we get from these. So I just hope you guys enjoyed this. I know this video is long. I doubt very many of you stuck around this long and saw the whole thing. But if you did, hey, thanks for watching, man, because this thing was like 40, 50 hours of work. I don't think I'm going to get my money wor my money's worth on this video. I think I'll probably end up making like $2 an hour on the time I spent here. But this one was honestly a little bit more for me than anything because to me this was beating the game. I never played the main story. I don't really intend to. 
but me outpost and this type of stuff that was the fun part of this game and after this i really genuinely feel like i actually beat the game i feel very satisfied i'm very happy with how this came out and if you decide to do it too hopefully it all works out for you and now you know how to beat the outpost game do the final version the best vitinium fuel rod in the system in the game and get 300,000 xp per minute in starfield